Hello, everyone, and welcome to Headwise, the weekly video cast and podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel. I am the founder of Migraine Nation, and I have had chronic and daily migraines since the age of four. I'm excited to be here today with repeat guest and headache medicine specialist, Dr. Fred Cohen. Hello, Dr. Cohen. How are you doing? I'm well. Thank you for having me back. Well, thank you for being here. We are very excited to hear what you have to say. You're an awesome guest. Um, Dr. Cohen is an assistant professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He is also a headache specialist. He has an awesome viewpoint on all the things we want to hear about. Our topic today is monosodium glutamate or MSG as a migraine trigger. Is there really evidence that it could be a trigger? If I want to eliminate it from my diet, how do I do so? It is much trickier than you might think. And we're also going to talk a bit about dietary triggers in general and what we can do to eliminate them or go about avoiding them, et cetera. So Dr. Cohen, for our guests who may not know who you are, can you tell them what motivates you to work in headache medicine? Sure. So like you yourself have said, I too suffer from migraine. I did it my entire life since I can remember. And I had no idea. I just suffered from this horrible headache I would get every week. And I just went about my life. And it was in med school, sitting in class, in neurology class, where they brought up, this is a migraine. And it was eye-opening. And then from there, I met headache specialists and now, for the first time in my life, I received help for a condition that burdened me my entire life. It was so debilitating. And I realized this is the kind of doctor I want to be. I want to, you know, give this help that has helped me so much. And that's what led me to my both my career being a provider and doing my research. Mm -hmm. And I love it very much. Oh, I love to hear that. So first of all, uh, I want to just say that the word trigger is becoming sort of a dirty word in the migraine community. Focusing too much on triggers can sometimes bring us anxiety. Some of us have a tendency to get a little hyper-focused on finding our triggers and start blaming ourselves every time we experience a migraine symptom like we did something wrong. In your opinion, what role do triggers in general play in migraine disease? So, you know, I you're absolutely right. I have many patients who could become very focused on triggers and finding it. So the, there, there is a role. And, you know, triggers are a vast thing. And why do they exist is migraine, these attacks are process of neuroinflammation. It's this whole inflammation cascade that gets set off. And what sets it off? And that's a very good question. Um, if we solve it, you'll win the Nobel Prize in medicine. There's many reasons we don't fully understand, but it's for some people, it might be some of these external things that are happening, you know, and many patients come to me trying to find the trigger. And for some people, they might not find, you know, it might just be a more internal process. Oh, but then I've also have patients that have found triggers. And, you know, certainly a lot of things could be, you know, a trigger. So um, in in your opinion, how many triggers do you think the average person with migraine has? What I, you know, tell my patients is first, every single migraine, their headache, whatever condition they come before, they're unique. You know, there could be, we have our common triggers, which I'll talk about in a second. But the, the example I always give is this was a true story of a case I had a couple of months ago, where over months of this patient following me, she kept a good headache log. We figured out the headaches were occurring. Her migraine attacks were happening in the morning. And long story short, I said, oh, you know what? Tell me what you're having for breakfast. And it was eggs. I said, stop eating eggs. And the migraine stopped. And what? Eggs being a trigger? I never saw that again. But for that patient, it you know happened to be a trigger for her. So the range could be certainly anything. For myself, mm -hmm. flying on a plane is a trigger. If I know I go up in the air after landing that night, I'm going to have a bad migraine attack. The more common, you know, uh, uh, triggers that we see are weather changes is very common. You know, I've had patients that could be like, I could predict when it's going to rain, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, any barometric pressure changes, being in hot weather, you know, doing extensive exercise, being dehydrated or common, lack of sleep or change of sleep. But then we also have dietary ones. So common dietary ones could be alcohol, could be caffeine. Caffeine's actually interesting as a double-edged sword. You have mm -hmm. patients who caffeine will help their migraine attacks. You have those that will trigger the migraine attacks. There's gluten, you know, artificial sweeteners, certainly I hear a lot. And then nitrates, which, you know, you find in processed meats and whatnot. Okay. So let's get back to MSG. We are going to talk a little bit about triggers in general. Uh, we're going to focus on MSG today. 
What is monosodium glutamate or MSG? So MSG, monosodium uh, glutamate, in the name, you know, it's a form of glutamate, which is amino acid, and we find it in various forms, lots of ways. Our body produces glutamate on its own. We also digest it. You know, glutamate is throughout our entire body. Our brains use it a lot. Glutamate, you know, you could think of a more simple state is a uh, like brain energy. You know, the, the the neurons, you know, utilize this to send signals and whatnot. And the monosodium glutamate is a form of it. And it does occur naturally. It's not, a lot of people think it is a synthetic sweetener. Um, mm -hmm. It is naturally found. And you actually can find it in foods such as tomatoes, um, some cheeses like Parmesan cheddar have it. Uh, certain fishes like uh, anchovies and sardines have it, squid and clams have it, and like seaweed and kelp, they all naturally have it. You know, and of course it could be used um, as a additive in foods in, uh, in, uh, in various ways. That was going to be my next question. And I love that you said that uh, MSG, I was so surprised to hear this because I actually embarrassingly have a degree or two in nutrition. And I did not know that MSG naturally occurred in foods until uh, we were talking about this episode, but it does, right? It's not just an additive. Correct. It's not just, it's not, it's not just an additive. Right. So there's foods that um, I wouldn't have considered um, removing from my diet if I was trying to get rid of MSG until you told me about it. So I find that very interesting in this episode. So how much evidence is there that MSG is actually a trigger for migraine? So the evidence is sort of muddled the best way to put it. You know, I'll start with the history of it. You know, MSG as a trigger for symptoms started back in the late 60s. It's a very mm -hmm. interesting story uh, by a physician named Dr. Uh, Manquak, who sort of came up with this constellation of, of, of symptoms. And he dubbed it coming from Chinese food and actually was dying of the symptom with the, the condition was called Chinese restaurant syndrome. And it sort mm -hmm. of exploded. Various articles in the 70s and 80s came up with people consuming MSG and causing abdominal pain, headache, you know, bloating, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually later that Dr. Kwok was that he actually was referring to American made Chinese food, not, he's actually Cantonese. He was like, no, like I was talking about how the United States make it, not all Chinese food. And he regrets right. calling it that. So the evidence was the, they did these trials in the seventies, eighties and nineties, where they gave MSG to participants in both uh, food, meaning they would do a broth, a soup, a meal, and they would add MSG, or they would do it as like a soda, a drink, and they would add it as well. But the, and the trials show that it could, some of them showed it caused headaches, some didn't, you know, mm -hmm. but what's interesting is the trials, they would use a lot of MSG. We're talking <laughs> one and a half to three grams of MSG. <laughs> the actual average intake of MSG is around 0.4 to maybe one gram. So it's a lot. So, you know, it's a lot of MSG. So mm -hmm. that's, it's, it's sort of muddled that, well, like, for instance, if I drink, you know, a ton of caffeine, while caffeine doesn't, you know, trigger a migraine, I will start getting jittery if I just start consuming a ton of caffeine. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's very questionable right. if MSG is truly a trigger for headache and migraine. Okay. So um, is there any physiology that we're aware of? Is there any physiology you can tell us behind the possibility of MSG causing migraine? There are some theories with it. They have done a lot of studies on mice and rats, but again, it's giving a ton of MSG and it has shown like neuronal changes and whatnot. Uh, the thought is that MSG could cause headache and migraine because again, it's glutamate. Think of glutamate as neuron energy. It's causing all this uh, uh, glutaminergic activation. So a lot of pathways can become activated when consuming it. Okay. Uh, I find that very interesting. So I love that answer. Um, so we're going to get to the part that was most fun for me. As I mentioned before, I want to hear all these foods that MSG is in that I was not aware of. Um, can you give us some idea of the foods that MSG is in um, just so that we are aware? Sure. So foods that MSG is naturally in is one, I was saying tomatoes, you know, um, there's various kinds of fish, such as anchovies, uh, sardines, clams, squid have MSG naturally in it. Um, kelp, seaweed, you know, also an ocean have it. And then you have stuff such as uh, peas can have it in it, potatoes to a small amount have it in it. 
um, and also corn to a small degree. When I say small, the amount I'm talking about is around maybe 50 to 200 milligrams. You know, again, I would to give numbers, I was saying before how these trials gave like 1.5 to 3 grams. While it's naturally in these foods, again, it's a small amount. Okay. What about the use of MSG in cooking? So MSG is commonly thought to be in Chinese cuisine, Asian cuisine, which, you know, it is used, but it's used a lot too. It's used in Italian cooking. It's used, mm -hmm. you know, it is a, uh, as I said, it is a, uh, it is a, a, a flavor enhancer. You know, mm -hmm. MSG is a umami substance. Umami is one of the taste buds, you know, and that, and so it's like, think of adding something sour, something salty, something savory. Umami is, uh, I'm sorry, umami, I'm saying. Umami is one of these taste buds. Uh -huh. And that's what MSG serves. So it's used in various cookings. It's not just Asian cuisine, which again is another misnomer. Because people commonly will think, oh, I have an insensitivity to MSG. I'm going to only avoid Chinese food. But then they go out to other takeout restaurants and it certainly could be there. Right. Okay. So we've no, we've listed some foods it's naturally in. We pointed out that it's in used in cooking in various foods, but it's also as an additive. Am I right? In a lot of processed foods, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's chips or things like that, where it's more obvious and you can read it on the label. Correct. Yes, it's found in a lot of processed foods. It's a it's a commonplace um, additive, and you could see it on the ingredients. Okay, so let's talk about um, elimination diets. How do you recommend going about an elimination diet? So elimination diet, the most important thing is uh, adherence, you know, keeping to it. Because what is an elimination diet? It's hence what it says you're removing something from your diet. And mm -hmm. what I recommend when patients ask me that is, well, what do I do? How long? Two weeks. So I'll use, as we're talking about MSG as an example, that means for two weeks, you're diligent about making sure everything you consume does not have that, does not have MSG or whatever you're removing, because you want to make sure that, you know, is this actually having an effect or not? Do one kind of food. I don't recommend because you want to know what's causing it. If you eliminate a lot of things at once, you're not going to truly know. And patients ask, well, where should I start? And you, when I when I get asked that, I think, well, do you have, if there's certain meals or foods that you have, you know, a thought of it doing, start with that. But if not, you go one by one, two weeks, you know, don't consume dairy, two weeks, don't consume alcohol, two weeks, don't consume caffeine. And, you know, again, you keep to that strict timetable. Um, and if you get those two weeks, and you would not notice effect then, then it's not a trigger. But if you do notice, oh, you know what, these past two weeks, my migraine, my headache, they haven't been as severe, then, you know, that might certainly suggest it could be a possible trigger for you. Okay. So I love that. So we use MSG as an example, but if you want to do an elimination diet, it's, it's two weeks and be very strict about it and then move on to the next thing that you think could be causing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a really important advice because people are always wondering and, and you might not be eliminating it long enough. So um, thank you for that advice. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to add to our discussion of MSG, MSG as a migraine trigger? You know, I, I would add that, you know, first of all, it certainly can be, I don't want to diminish anyone who they, you know, they do think that MSG is, you know, causing related to their migraine or headache attacks. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if, if you yourself have thought, oh, MSG is a trigger for me, but just, and think about what have you been eating? Because like I said, for a lot of patients, they think that then when I bring this up, they go, oh, no, I've been eating these other kinds of takeouts. Oh, when I look at my snacks, there it is. Because mm -hmm. again, it's very easy to label it to one kind of food, you know, and again, I don't want people thinking, oh, I'm going to stop eating tomatoes and whatnot. The, the studies that have done it, they did a large amount. It could very well be that certain people have a certain threshold. Like if I go over a gram, two grams, et cetera. So the natural consumption of machine might not trigger it, but you know, if you eat a processed food or a takeout place that they put a lot in, that could certainly trigger it. You know, it's, it's, it's like everyone's migraine and headache is unique and you might have a different threshold or it might not affect you at all. Okay. Um, Dr. Cohen, before we go, I believe you have a website now where you have some advice for people that love to hear what you have to say. What is that? 
Sure. Thank you. Uh, Headache123.com. Uh, it has a lot of articles. I publish a bit about myself as well as I do a blog about hot topics going on in headache medicine. I just did a post about vitamin D and migraine. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Thank, thank you, you for everyone. having me. And <laughs> thank you everyone for listening. Please join us again next week for our next episode of Headwise. Bye-bye.